Welcome to Psych 230, Social Psychology. Uh, today we're uh, continuing with our lecture on affiliation and friendship. And um, last time we talked about, uh, uh, we introduced the theories, some theories of affiliation and friendship. Uh, and we started talking about the goals, the reason people affiliate, the reason they form friendships, okay? We started talking about, you know, goals like, you know, getting social support, that's one reason why we affiliate with others, why we basically associate with others, right? And we started talking about the second goal, which is getting information. Another reason we associate with others is because we want information. We want to know certain things. And we're going to continue with that today. Um, another way to get information from our affiliations, from the people we associate with, uh, is through social comparison. Social comparison is used to get information, right? Uh, it, comparing ourselves can tell us about our abilities, you know, where we stand, you know, are we average, are we above average, you know, are we below, right, our opinions, right, are we in the majority and the minority when it comes to what we believe, uh, or is our opinion acceptable to others, that kind of stuff, how desirable are we, that kind of stuff, right, um, uh, there's a lot of information we can get from just comparing ourselves to others, to see where we stand relative to other people, okay, but we also maintain a positivity bias when we compare ourselves to others. We usually compare ourselves to similar others. Um, research shows, for instance, that uh, you know, friends actually tend to have friends that are similar in attractiveness to themselves. People tend to have friends who are, that are similar in attractiveness. So if you have a very attractive girl or a very attractive woman, she'll usually have friends that are also very attractive. The ones that are average will have friends that are more average. Same thing with males. That doesn't mean that you can't have friends that are very good looking, much better looking than you are or worse looking or whatever it is. But research shows that on average, we tend to associate with similar others when it comes to looks, abilities, uh, all sorts of things. And we feel good, of course, when we are with these people because they are like us and they validate us, right? They're, they're like us, similar in ability, similar in attractiveness. And so if they're okay, we are okay. Someone who's doing much better than you, comparing yourself to someone who's doing much better than you can make you feel worse about yourself, right? I mean, if you wanna feel like, you know, you wanna know where you stand financially, right? Uh, whether uh, you're successful or not, uh, you're probably gonna compare yourself with people who are similar. Like if you're middle-class with other middle-class people and say, well, I'm doing okay, I'm just like these people. But if you compare yourself with people who are very rich, you're gonna feel poor. Okay, so we try to maintain uh, sort of a positive opinion of ourselves. We have a positivity bias, and that means we're usually going to look for others, associate with others who are like ourselves, and they will make us feel good because they're okay and therefore we're okay. So let's talk about these comparisons. We mentioned this before, but we'll talk about them in terms of getting information from others, right? Like, you know, um, we affiliate to get information from others. So an upward social comparison is a double edged sword. So like I said, um, comparing yourself to someone who's doing better than you can make you feel uncomfortable. It can make you feel worse about yourself, right? Especially if that other person is doing better than you at something that's very important to you, something that's central to your self-esteem. Even if it's a friend or a sibling, if, doing, if they're doing much better than you at something that's important to you, something that really matters to you, you can feel worse, okay? Um, but uh, you know, comparing yourself to someone who's better off can also inspire you, it can motivate you, right? To make you wanna work harder, make you want to excel and become like those people. So it can go both ways. But I can tell you from experience and, uh, and from research that most of the time comparing yourself with someone who is better off than you are just usually makes you feel worse. It makes you feel that you're not as desirable, maybe physically, right? You're not as attractive, you're not, as popular, you're not as rich, as funny, or whatever it is, it can make you feel worse. And you might be actually doing well compared to the average person, but those people can make you feel like you're not that good, okay? Um, you know, like I said, you know, uh, you may think that you're doing okay, relatively successful, maybe you're middle class or upper middle class or something like that. And, but if you compare yourself to, uh, to like billionaires, for instance, just to pick something that's extreme, you can feel right down miserable and, and extremely poor by comparing yourself to those people. You know, those people own an average of nine houses and they have different houses in different parts of the world. They might have one in Paris, 
<laughs> one in LA, one in New York, in different places that they actually want to be at. Um, and they can make us feel very inadequate, the way they dress, uh, the opportunities they have, right? The kind of things they, uh, that they get to take advantage of, right? Um, and that's what happens when you compare yourself with someone who, that's what can happen if you compare yourself with someone who's a lot better off than you are on anything when it comes to intelligence, looks, money, whatever it is. So it's a double-edged sword. You have to be, uh, you, you have to be uh, careful with that. It can inspire you, motivate you, but it can also make you feel awful about yourself. Another reason we affiliate with others that we want to associate with others, form friendships, according to research, is to gain status, right? We want to gain status. We want to have more authority, uh, more power. Status comes in different forms, but we want to we want to be in a better position, basically. So humans, like baboons, often form alliances, right? Uh, groups, friendships, right? Associate, associate themselves with others in order to improve their position in the social dominance, dominance hierarchy. You often form friendships, connections, so that you can basically uh, rise in prestige and in status, so you can improve your position. And of course, we know that higher status is associated with greater rewards. Those that are of higher status are treated better. They're given more opportunities. Uh, you know, they, they have, they live in better neighborhoods. Uh, they get to date and marry better looking people. Uh, they get to eat better food. Uh, they get to go to more prestigious events and parties. Uh, and they're tr just treated much better just by the virtue of who they are and their, their position because of their status. And they don't always have to pay for those things, by the way. Okay, often they're just treated a lot better just because of who they are. Okay. Um, and there's others, for instance, who will associate with people who are well off, rich, famous, so that they can also get those rewards. Remember, we talked about that. That's basking in reflected glory. So often we want to affiliate, associate with ourselves with those that have high who have high status, so we can get some of those rewards too. So we too can be treated better. So we can get those dates, we can get, you know, those opportunities, uh, whatever it is that they get, whatever it is that they have access to. More about gaining status, men versus women. Uh, men's relationships, when men affiliate uh, with others, um, men's relationships, when men affiliate with other men, okay? Uh, men tend to emphasize what is called status seeking. Men care more about status. So they, their relationships are more hierarchical. They care about things like who is stronger, who has the bigger muscles, right? Who makes more money? Who has the better looking girlfriend or wife? Who has the, you know, the faster car? Men care about all kinds of stuff like that. Who's better on the basketball court, you know? Uh, they, they're always bragging and comparing themselves. Uh, and that's what men do with each other. Um, their uh, relationships are also more instrumental. Men also associate with... Uh, each other often to solve problems, you know, like help fix a, a car, right? Um, it's really easy to make friends, for instance, if, um, you know, let's say if uh, somebody is, uh, is working on a car and you happen to be passing by and just ask them, hey man, what kind of engine does that have? Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and you just, you know, help out, so to speak, or people can help you out. Uh, a lot of men love cars and will help each other out when it comes to fixing a car, when it comes to improving it or, or whatever it is, um, or even uh, you know, adding something to the house, a home improvement project. Uh, men's relationships are about that sort of thing, about status, who's better at this or that, and, and also about helping each other out with physical things, with those kind of things. Men love to do things with their hands. And they love to teach other men and help other men. And it's a way to bond, believe it or not, if you're into that kind of stuff. Women's relationship, according to research, emphasize more intimacy. Women provide more emotional support for each other, more of a shoulder to cry on, more likely to talk about personal things and relationships and things like that. Men's relationships don't always get into that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, when you have relationships with other men, friendships, and you start talking too much about your feelings, they start looking at you like something is wrong with you. Like, what the heck's wrong with you, man? Like, like that kind of like, stop crying about it. Like, uh, like toughen up. It's, you know, it's just, you know, be a man, you know, that kind of stuff. It, like, and if you start to cry or show your feelings, you know, it's almost like they look down on you. And even if they don't 
think that way and they don't look down on you, men are embarrassed to show their feelings in front of other men. And when men often do show their feelings, their sensitive side, they're more likely to do that with a woman than a man, with a female friend or in a relationship with a female, even a romantic relationship, rather than they are with a man. Okay, it's just uh, very hard uh, as a man to show your feelings in front of other men, especially if you come from a culture uh, that's very traditional, uh, that's kind of male dominated uh, or, or a macho kind of culture like the Latino cultures. You know, we're not supposed to show our feelings in front of others. You know, it's just like cry in front of other men. Like, are you kidding? And my family was so dysfunctional, extreme, like we can't even say I love you to each other. Try to say I love you to another man, right? If you can, then it's like you're emotionally healthy. You can show that. But most men cannot say I love you to another man because they're afraid that they're going to be thought of as being gay or something like that. And it's, it's really that kind of thing that has to do with dominance and hierarchy and things like that. Whereas women can do that. Women can tell each other they love each other and talk about those kind of things more easily, provide a shoulder to cry on, right? So women's relationships are a bit different, okay? Men's relationships emphasize status a, a lot more than women's. So in general, uh, to sum things up, men get more respect from their relationships. They're always comparing themselves helping each other out and seeing who's on top, who, you know, who's better, whatever that can, and women just get more affection. Women are treated better by other women and just other people. Their relationships emphasize more kind of intimacy, more support, more sharing, right? More emotional stuff. Whereas men often don't want to show their emotions in front of other men. Let's keep going. Um, I mentioned this already, but here it is again, because it has to do with affiliation, with associating with others. Uh, yes, people, especially when it comes to status, right? Um, people will want to bask in reflected glory, right? People have a desire for friends with high status um, so that they can basically obtain those rewards that those high status people get as well. So the desire for friends and high status others is especially strong in status oriented cultures. Um, it's believe it or not, believe it or not, it's higher in Japan than the US. In Japan, they care a lot about status. And associating with someone who's rich or who's the boss or something like that is important. It is still important in the U.S., but apparently it's it's much higher in Japan uh, and, and in some other cultures. But yes, we do care a lot about status in this country, right? I mean, uh, we want to have friends who, for instance, are wealthy, who are well connected, who are famous. If we can, I mean, if we can have those friends at all, many many of us, of course, most of us are not going to have friends like that because those are just not the people that we encounter in our daily lives. But yeah, wouldn't you love it, right? If one of your friends was actually someone who was a movie star or a famous musician, or maybe someone who's rich and successful or the head of a company, right? Uh, there's some people who know people like that and want to associate with them and want to be friendly with those people so they can become friends and they can get, get opportunities, maybe a job or maybe get to go to those nice places or invited to nice parties or nice homes or whatever it is. Um, there are rewards to, that come with associating with these people. You even get to meet other people who are successful and who might give you opportunities. You need to meet, uh, you know, more desirable people as far as looks, better looking people, because these people attract very good looking people. And you might have a chance to meet people like that, if that's what you're into. And you might say, well, I'm not that shallow. I don't care about that stuff. If you had the opportunity, you met someone famous, someone rich, someone extremely gifted, a talented musician who's very successful, um, I don't think you'd turn down a friendship from that person. Okay, unless they were really mean to you, of course, but let's say being friendly with you, I mean, you would leap at the chance, I think, to associate with somebody like that. Most of us would, it's just uh, natural. We wanna be with people who are powerful, who have high status, because they provide us with rewards, okay? And we also wanna cut off reflected failure to maintain our status. We want to disassociate ourselves, break the ties with those who could reflect poorly on us, those who are dishonest, those who are hostile, those who are st stigmatized, those who are basically, you know, like, uh, for instance, criminals and things like that. We have people like that probably in our family, some of us more than others, and sometimes we don't want to be seen with those people because so-and-so is a drug addict or so-and-so, you know, is a, a criminal. Or I have people like that in my family, and I don't really do that. I don't cut off that you know, those people, I still talk to them. You know, uh, like I said before, I'm not going to trust them, like, let's say with my kids or anything like that, right? But 
you know, if they invite me to a party, I, I'll still go. As a matter of fact, I, you know, if I have a party at my house, I invite everybody, they're still welcome, right? But like I said, I'm not gonna trust them with my kids or people who I care about, but, but I don't really cut them off, especially if they're family, you know? But yeah, sometimes we have family members that reflect poorly on us for whatever reason, especially when you have a big family. Like a lot of Latinos have big families. And when you have a big family, you're likely to have people who are doing well. A lot of people are just average. And you're likely to have people who are doing very badly as well. Uh, uh, as well, And people who might even be criminals or just uh, people who most people would not be want to, want to be associated with. Yes, in my family, I had people who are, you know, gangsters. You know, and I'm talking about hardcore gangsters who have been in prison for like 10 years, who have done some awful things, not killed people, but have done some awful things they've gotten in trouble for, you know. Uh, like I, I talked about my cousin who was convicted of statutory rape, you know, and just people who have been to jail for doing other stupid things. And uh, I don't necessarily disassociate myself with these people. They're, they're family. I still accept them. And some of them I'm actually very close to. Um, but it certainly, uh, makes you, it makes it easier for you to maintain your status if you don't associate with those people. And I can tell you how important that is. There's this one time I was, uh, I was at the dog park, um, actually the playground, a park, uh, it was that, that dog park right there. And there's a playground there for the kids as well. I was there with my kids and, uh, I was there, other parents are there with their kids. And I started talking to this one guy who was there, you know, jogging around the dog park and stuff like that. And we started talking and, you know, we were getting along and stuff like that. And it seems like we were gonna have a friendship, right? It was, a, it was just a, a very good connection there. And he was telling about his life, I was talking about mine and we're getting along really well and stuff like that. And, um, you know, we were gonna exchange numbers so we can hang out and things like that. Uh, but at the end, I told him that I have a cousin <laughs> who was in prison. And let's just say that after that, he just quietly kind of walked away. It wasn't obvious, but uh, yeah, we didn't get to connect and exchange numbers and kind of turn that into a friendship. And it was because I mentioned that, actually. And I should mention also this person happened to be white. And, you know, when, yeah, when you're talking about like, I'm Latino and you happen to, you know, happen to mention, yeah, you're your criminal, you know, cousin and stuff like that. He's probably afraid that, you know, he's going to get shot or something like that. But that's what happens, right? Uh, if, if when you don't cut off these people, they can take away opportunities. They can make you seem lower status or less desirable of a friend or as a person yourself, right? But I don't do that. You know, it's just people are going to accept me or not accept me. It doesn't matter to me. But, you know, that could have been a, a friendship and it just didn't go that way. Maybe I shouldn't have shared that until later. I've met other people also when I jog, when I go hiking, and but sometimes I just say hi, I'm friendly, and uh, many times I just don't carry it further, but sometimes I feel like, you know, we could have had a friendship there. I felt like, you know, that could have been someone I could have hung out with, we could have some drinks with or something like that, and I just, I just didn't go there, you know, didn't take the extra step, like, hey, man, you want to hang out, like, uh, give me a call or something like that, you know, um, but yeah, it, often we just want to disassociate with ourselves with the people who reflect poorly on us because they actually will take away our status and are likely to uh, reduce the rewards that we could get, the social rewards from other people, attention, attention friendships, uh, even opportunities uh, for jobs and things like that. Um, more about gaining status associations. Uh, here's an, exp an experiment that was done um, that shows you the extent to which uh, affiliation matters for status. So students in one experiment were assigned either to the blue team, well, students, so students in one experiment were assigned to the blue team to work together on intellectual problems, okay? They were assigned to a team and they called it the blue team, okay? And after they worked together on these problems together, they were told that their team scored either Above 90% of people their age, that was one group. Another group of people were told, your group scored below 70% of, uh, of people uh, your age. And there were other people who weren't giving any, any information. That was a control group. They just got to work together, right? What happened afterward, uh, they were given an opportunity to wear the badge, wear a badge that said blue team, okay? And what happened is, so you see the graph right there? Um, 
you have the vertical line there from, um, you know, it says 20 to 100 zeros all the way at the bottom, right? It says the percentage taking a blue team badge. And then you have the, the bars there, right? The, in the failure condition, those that were told that your group is scored below 70% of people your age. Those that were given no information and those that were told your group scored, you know, above 90%, you know? And you can see that those that uh, were told that your group did well, uh, they were more likely to wear the badge that said blue team, right? Because it's a sign of status, a sign of success. And for the other people, it was a sign of failure. So they didn't want to wear it. Those in the failure condition, those that were told that your group didn't do very well. And of course, the people who were given no information, they were somewhere in the middle, 50-50. And this is exactly like basically, you know, are you going to wear that, uh, you know, that sweatshirt that says, you know, Harvard, right? Very successful, UCLA uh, versus Antelope Valley College, right? AVC, right? I don't see a lot of people wearing those things. But when you go to a successful school, a pretty good school, UCLA, USC, Harvard, whatever it is, those places, you'll see a lot of people wearing those shirts, those sweatshirts, even their parents, right? Because it's like they're showing off, right? They're saying, look, I went there or I have a kid that goes there. I'm high status. I'm somebody. That's what it really means. Or sports, right? When your team, whether it's the Lakers or whatever it is, is doing really well, you'll be wearing the Laker jersey, right? and the Laker jackets and things like that. And then when they win the championship, the flags are everywhere. When they lose or they don't even make the playoffs, you don't see too many people with that stuff, with the flags and the jerseys and things like that because they don't want to you know, display that because now it's a sign of low status rather than high status. When the team does well, you want to associate, affiliate with the team and you want to show basically uh, that you're a part of that, that this is your team. You know, So you're more likely to... Uh, to do that. Same thing, you know, where you want to, where you, you drive a BMW or a Mercedes, you want to show that you're high status. Maybe you got it used and it doesn't really mean you're high status, right? And you can't really afford it, a, a new one, but you want to seem like you're high status, right? So the, uh, so the group that was in the failure condition, what they were doing is cutting off reflected failure. They didn't want to wear the, the badge. It reflects poorly on them. And those that were in the success condition, they basked in reflected glory. They wore the badge saying, look, this is a sign of pride, right? That I'm somebody, we're smart, whatever it means, okay? And that's what the experiment showed. Another reason we associate with others, we affiliate with others, is to exchange material benefits. Yes, to exchange goods and services or exchange all kinds of things, not always goods and services. I, I mentioned uh, something about, actually, I mentioned a little bit about this already. But um, we're, yeah, we're starting a different uh, section here. So the exchanging of material benefits is actually crucial for the survival of all societies. That's why we have a society. It's so we can exchange things. Some people are good at this. Some people are good at that, right? And you can exchange things and make the whole society better. Some people might be good at building things. Other people might be good at maybe teaching. Other people might be uh, good at... Uh, you know, whatever it is, farming and growing food. And if you work together, you can help each other out. Exchange something that you built for some food, exchange some food for them teaching your kids or taking care of your kids. And this is what we do in a study. We exchange things and we take on different roles and we have all these rules about how we exchange things and how much things are worth. And that's how society works. We're a lot better off together than we are alone. Imagine if you had to grow all your food, build your own house, right? And build your own mode of transportation and solve all the problems all on your own or just your family, right? How hard that would be as opposed to having a bunch of people who do different things and are good at different things. And then they help each other out by exchanging things, okay? Social exchange is the trading of benefits within relationships. The trading of benefits. I give you this, you give me that. Sometimes it's not actually something physical. It could be something else we'll talk about in a moment. So when it comes to uh, exchanging material benefits, um, equity is sometimes important and sometimes it's not, okay? Equity, I, I mentioned this before, but equity is when the person's benefits and costs are proportional to the benefits and costs that the other person incurs. So for instance, equity would mean that, uh, uh, for instance, if you 
put in a lot, then you get a lot, for instance. Or if you put in very little, you get very little, okay? Someone who puts in the same amount as you should get the same amount as you. That's equity, that's fair, okay? Um, that's what we mean by fairness. It's like, a, put it, let's think of it this way. If you pay $2 for that loaf of bread, right? You pay $2, you get a loaf of bread. Somebody else pays $2, and gets the same loaf of bread. That is fair, that is equitable, right? You put in the same cost, you get the same thing back, okay? If you put in very little, you get very little. If you put in a lot, you get a lot, right? If it's equitable, if it's fair, that means people's costs and benefits are, you know, similar, you know, as, uh, as the, the ones that are for other people, okay? But here's the thing, equity is not always maintained in social relationships. There's some relationships where equity, where fairness is very important, and everyone has to kind of follow the rules equally and gets equal, you know, gets the rewards based on how much they put in. And there are very strict rules. And there are other relationships where equity is not that important and it's not really maintained. And we'll talk, we're gonna talk about these different relationships. So here we have the uh, different types of relationships. So we have relationships that, uh, that involve communal sharing. That's one type of relationship. We also have, authority ranking, we have equality matching, and we have market pricing. These are different models of social exchange. You can say different type of relationships, and they're gonna have different rules, and then I'll give you an example of each. Okay, so let's talk about the first one, communal sharing. And by the way, this looks a lot better if I was actually doing the, uh, the presentation and, and, and you could see things flowing instead of just changing slides in this way. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, I'm dig digressing there, but uh, the so communal sharing is a type of relationship where everyone shares in the group's resources as needed and depend on one another for mutual care. So people get what they need and they depend on one another and they help each other out according to what they need. So an example of that would be a tight knit family. Okay, um, I will tell you now, although this information will be written in a in, in a, 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 uh, a slide that's coming up in a moment, that it, with communal sharing, equity is not really maintained, not always. Most of the time it's not. In a tight-knit family, or just think about a family, what happens in a family is that the husband and wife do most of the work, but the kids get most of the benefit. The husband and wife you know, work very hard, they make all the money, they buy the food, they buy everything, and the kids, they don't work. They don't make any money. Often they don't, and, uh, but they get to benefit from all those things. They get to eat as much as they want, as much as they need. They get to live in the home and watch TV and do all these things. That's communal sharing. People just share according to what they need. You live in this house, we're gonna take care of you. You're gonna eat, you're gonna sleep here. You're gonna watch TV. We're the adults, we're the ones who work and provide. You're the kid, right? You can't really work and provide, but that's okay because you're a part of this family and we're still gonna take care of you. Okay, that's communal sharing, okay? It's not fair, but that's okay. That's the way it is. As in a family, uh, that's the way it is. As a parent, you're gonna work really hard and you are gonna incur most of the cost and your kids are gonna get most of the benefit. And that's the way it is in most families. And that's the way it should be. Kids are vulnerable, they can't do very much, they can't really contribute very much, but we'll do anything for them, we'll work hard for them. We don't get much from the kids other than maybe their affection, their love, right? Uh, but it's not like they give us money or they work for us or take care of us, right? We take care of them and we provide everything. That's communal sharing. Everyone gets according to what they need. Those that are older, this could also be in a, a larger group like a, if you're a, in a, you live in one of those uh, villages that's kind of a very rural or, um, or kind of in, indigenous where they, they live kind of like in the old ways where they have uh, you know, older people there who can't really provide because they're old and they're weaker, uh, but they still get fed. They still are taken care of. They're the elderly uh, group. And then you have the people who are somewhere in the middle who are strong and can provide and they hunt and they, they just provide. 
and then you have and, and they get most of the costs and they also of course get part of the benefit too and then you have children don't do very much either but still of course get to share in whatever is gained you know but that's communal sharing it's like a family people provide for each other and it doesn't matter that you're sick and you can't do much they will still take care of you okay it's that kind of community some people have tried living in communities like that where they don't care about who does more and who gets more, where they just try to take care of each other, live in this kind of happy, kind of hippie kind of community. People have tried that, okay? Um, it doesn't always work. You need very nice people that are very committed and to each other, but uh, there are groups like that. You know, that might also be the case with the Amish people. I don't know too much about them, but I think they just live together and take care of each other. And certain people do different things and the men work really hard and so do the women and you know the kids have their chores um but i'm assuming they don't do as much as the as the grown-ups okay but they still are taken care of another kind of relationship is authority ranking uh this one is very different with authority ranking what happens there that's the kind of relationship where higher ranking individuals are entitled to a greater share of the resources those that are higher rank are going to get more they're more powerful, they're higher status, so they get more because of their rank, okay? That would be like in a military squad. When you're just, I don't know what they call, you know, the different levels, but let's say you're just a private or a recruit or whatever it is, and you're there in the group, right? They make you run, they make you exercise, right? You get to sleep in these, uh, uh, in these uh, small tents with other people, and you just have a little bunk, and you get to eat with everybody there in a big cafeteria and uh and you don't necessarily get the best sleeping uh quarters or whatever the, the best living conditions or the best food um and you're not treated that great because you're a low-ranking member whereas the officer or the commander or whatever you call the person they have their own little place where they sleep by themselves and it's not luxury i'm saying they have their own little cabin their own little shack whatever it is that's all for them and they are treated better. Uh, they have uh, they have other uh, uh, benefits, or or I should say, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, other privileges that you don't have as a lower ranking member. They might even be entitled to like uh, nicer meals, and uh, maybe nicer dinnerware or whatever it is. And the highest ranking member of the military is the president, and you know that the president gets treated much better than the people who are just privates or whatever it is, whatever they call them in the military, or, or the rest of us who are civilians. The president gets to live in this huge house called the White House and eats off of gold-plated uh, plates, right? And, and dinnerware, and they have a lot of servants and a lot of security. They're treated like royalty. That's the highest member of the military. And we're okay with that because that's that kind of relationship. It's authority ranker, ranking. It's the president. It's the highest ranking member of the country, of the military, and they get treated the best. And the lower you go, the worse you're treated. That's that kind of relationship. Okay. We also have another kind of relationship called equality matching. And equality matching, as the name implies, right, that's the kind of relationship with no one gets more than the others, right? People take turns. People share. They reciprocate, right? Like children playing a game. Let's say you're playing... Uh, baseball or something like that. There are rules, right? When it's your turn to bat, it's your turn to bat. When it's not your turn to bat, you sit on the bench and wait for your turn. When you're in the outfield, it's your turn to be out there and catch the ball or pass it or whatever you need to. There are rules and everybody gets a turn to bat. Everyone gets a turn to be in the outfield and that's equal. That's equality matching. We all kind of put in the same and we get the same kind. It's, it's kind of like that. It's like you try to basically make sure uh, that they're here in equality matching. There has to be fairness. There has to be equity. You get according to what you put in, or you know, if you put in the same as the other person, you get the same. You get treated the same, basically, is what that means. There's equity. There's fairness. Okay? And that's the way it should be also um, in our, uh, you know, when it comes to our jobs, right? If we, uh, you know, if we work hard, um, and we do as much as that other person, we should get paid the same as that other person, right? That's the way the, you know, your work would be if it was fair, but that's not the way it is. 
when it comes to work, it's more like authority ranking, right? The people at the top, the supervisor, or maybe the, the CEO, or, or whatever is the manager, they don't necessarily work harder than you do, but they get a lot more privileges. They get a lot better pay. So within our economy, within, within capitalism, it's not really equality matching. Some of that has to do with authority and rank and things like that. But actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. When it comes to economics, what, that, uh, what relates more closely to that would be market pricing. So let's move on to the, the last form of, of uh, model of social exchange here, this kind of relationship called market pricing. Market pricing is based on rational rules of self-interest. Everyone gets according to what they put in. You look for the best deal. Market pricing has to do with what you're worth. So if you work really hard, you should get more than someone who didn't work a lot. Equality matching, everybody gets the same, okay? Everyone gets an equal slice, so to, so to speak. Everyone gets treated the same, okay? With market pricing, that is capitalism right there, right? Rules of self-interest, okay? I will do what I can to make the most money to succeed. If I work hard and I succeed and I make a lot of money, that's fair because I worked hard. If you don't work that hard and you don't become that successful, then that's what you deserve because you didn't work as hard as me. That's market pricing, okay? Like the customer and the shopkeeper, right? If the shopkeeper has something that he or she is selling, maybe they're selling gasoline or something like that, right? They can charge the customer uh, what the customer is willing to pay. If the customer really needs that gasoline, the shopkeeper can charge them a ton of money for it because it's in demand. If the gasoline is not in demand and the customer doesn't really want it that much, doesn't want that much of it, you can think about several customers, right? Then the price will go down. The shopkeeper has to lower the price in order to sell it. But that's market pricing. If something is in demand, if it's worth a lot or a lot of people want it, then you can charge a lot of money for it and take advantage of people and even exploit people. You can see what happened during the beginning of, of COVID where you know, like people started hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer and even food and how it, become hard, it became hard to get certain things. And you found that those people were putting things online, selling hand sanitizer for ridiculous prices, selling toilet paper for ridiculous, selling food like a can of beans that or normally cost a you know, dollar, selling it for $5 for five times as much. That is market pricing. It was a time of need. Things were scarce. People were hoarding things. So things were in high demand. So they said, you know what? I have some of these things and I'm going to sell them at whatever price I can. I'm going to charge a high price. That's market pricing. If people want something, you can charge a lot of money for it. If people don't want it, then you can't charge a lot of money for it. You get, you look for the best deal basically for yourself. It's self-interest. It's supposed to work, the way it's supposed to work is that if you work hard, you get a lot. If you don't work hard, you don't get a lot. That's kind of market pricing. But it also has to do with what your worth is. Like a doctor's work is worth a lot more money than someone who just, uh, let's say, uh, is a, a janitor, for instance, okay? The doctor's worth a lot more. Their job's a lot more important, they save lives. A janitor, that's something that anybody can do. And so therefore they don't get paid that much. Their job is easy, doesn't require a lot of training. Anyone can do that job, okay? Whereas a doctor, especially like a surgeon or something like that, highly trained, not everyone can do that job. Not everyone is that well-trained. Not everyone is that smart and can do that. So they're entitled to a lot more pay. But of course, market pricing can get out of hand. It can be really like ridiculous uh, what occurs as a result of that, as, as a result of capitalism. It can get right down just really unfair, okay? Um, people wouldn't say it's, un people do say it's fair, by the way, but it can be ridiculous. Like nowadays, like a CEO of a company can get paid like a hundred million dollars a year. Whereas the average worker maybe is making $40,000 a year. Is the CEO really worth that much more than the average worker? Do they really work that much harder? Of course not, of course they don't. But that's what happens when you have capitalism. Those at the top give themselves most of the pay and most of the benefits, and they give the people at the bottom the minimum uh, that they can give them, you know, um, whatever they can get away with. And if they can get away with paying you almost nothing, they will do that. And that's why the government has to come in and say, we need to raise the minimum wage. 
because things are more expensive nowadays. It's not fair that you're paying people $7 an hour, right? Even if it is a job that doesn't require a lot of skill, it should be $15 an hour now. And that's where the government interferes with market pricing and tries to make things a little bit more fair, right? But of course, capitalism fights back and you know doesn't allow things to happen so much. But that's what you have with market pricing, okay? Self-interest, supposedly people get what they deserve according to what they put in, but that's not always true, okay? But that's the way it's supposed to happen. Another example would be like, hey, I take risks. I invest a lot of money. I can lose all my money, but I can also make a lot of money and become rich, right? It's supposed to be fair. You know, I take a lot of risk. I can lose a ton of money or I can make a ton of money. I take that risk and I deserve the reward if I get it, okay? That's also uh, market pricing. Exchanging of material benefits. Um, so here's the thing. Um, the careful tracking of inputs and outputs, how much you put in and how much you get out, um, that is something that happens in some relationships and not others. That's something that happens in equality matching relationships, right? Where they, they track how much you put in and how much you get out. And also in market pricing relationships. Okay, with equality matching, everything's equal, right? Everyone gets an equal amount and gets to put an equal amount. With market pricing relationship, um, you don't necessarily put in an equal amount, but if you put in a little bit, then you're entitled to a little bit. If you put in a lot, you're entitled to a lot. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to be carefully keep track of what you put in and what you get out. And the perfect example with, of that would be the stock market. If I buy a bunch of stock of a certain company and then it goes up in price, then I'm entitled to a whole bunch of money, depending on how much stock I bought. If I only bought a little bit and it goes up in price, I'm only entitled to a little bit more money. So there's carefully, there's a careful tracking of how much you put in and how much you get out in equality matching relationships and in market pricing relationships. With communal relationships, they're not concerned with tracking of inputs and outputs. Communal relationships, it's a need based, it's needs based rules. People get according to what they need. If you're old and you can't work very hard, you still get to eat. You still get to live. You still are taken care of. Same thing if you're a kid. If you're a middle age or a grown up, you can work really hard. So therefore you work out and you get what you need. You don't necessarily get more than the kids or more than the elderly. Um, you can do more, but you get what you need, not necessarily more. Kids can't do a lot, they get a lot. The elderly can't do a lot, but they get a lot. That's that kind of relationship, like a family, right? Where you just take care of each other and give people what they need. And, and not, it doesn't depend on what they can provide. And another example would be if you're, if you're sick, your spouse will excuse you from housework. Like if you're sick and you can't work, well, then your spouse has to pick up the slack and help you out. And that's okay because you can't do it. Just like when you have old people, they can't work. They're too weak or whatever it is, or maybe sick. Um, you still take care of them. And you basically work harder so that you can take care of yourself, your kids, and also them. You pick up the slack. Whoever can work harder will work harder for the other people. And people just take care of each other. Those that can work, those that can do certain things, they do them. Those that can't, they don't, but they're still taken care of. They're still part of a society. That would be a nice society to live in, right? If people didn't take advantage and just, you know, like not want to do anything, but that's what happens you know, in a family that loves each other. They just take care of each other, regardless of how much they put in. Proximity attraction people, uh, attraction principle. We are talking about exchanging of material benefits, right? In, uh, in relationships and when we affiliate with others, the proximity attraction principle uh, says that, uh, that there's a tendency to become friends with those who live and work nearby. So we're more likely to affiliate with others who are nearby, those that we happen to encounter. It's hard to be friends with people who are not around or impossible to be friends with someone who you don't meet one way or another. So that's the proximity attraction people, the people who are gonna affiliate with, the people who we're gonna become friends with, the people who we're going to uh, become attached to, bond with, and even the people we're gonna develop romantic relationships with are, just happen to be the people that are around, the people who are, physically close, that's what proximity means. The mere exposure effects says that the tendency to feel positively toward people, places, and things, mere exposure effect is the tendency to feel positively to people, places, and things we see frequently. Believe it or not, research supports this, the people that we see more often, we are more attracted to. We like those people more. They're more likely to be friends, more likely to become romantic partners, 
associates or whatever, the, whatever they are. That's the mere exposure effect. The longer we are exposed to certain people, the more comfortable we are with them. And the more likely they are to become friends, people we date, people we hang out with, people we work with, that kind of stuff. There's research that even shows that, um, that, um, that people also look better over time. The more you see them, the more attractive they look to you. Now, I'm not talking about a long period of time, but I'm talking about a short period of time, like where you see someone, you think they're a little goofy looking, but then you're around them a lot. After a while, that goofiness turns into a kind of, a, into a kind of, kind of cuteness where you start seeing like them in a different way. They, they start looking more attractive and more appealing to you just over time, okay? But of course, people can also get sick of each other and learn to hate each other and uh, become like less attracted to each other over time. But over a short period of time, the mere exposure effect uh, kind of works where people, you kind of, people grow on you, but then over time, you can also get sick of them over a longer period of time. Let's keep going. More about exchanging material benefits, something known as social capital. Social capital uh, is important to, of course, to affiliation. Social capital are the assets that can be drawn from personal relationships. Think of capital like money and social means it comes from other people. It's, it's like, how much can you get out of this relationship? That's social capital. Social capital, of course, decreases with distance. It's harder to get things from your relationships when people are far away. It's easier to borrow tools from your neighbor than from, let's say, your brother who lives 2,000 miles away. Your neighbor can really help you out. That relationship, you can get more social capital out of that one than, let's say, someone who lives far away. Even if that person is a family member, you can rely more on your neighbor, let's say, or get more from your neighbor. You can help each other because you're right there. Okay? Uh, you can help each other out. If you have kids and your parents live nearby, you can withdraw more social capital. They can help you more. They can help you raise your kids. They can babysit, right? Take the kid to uh, soccer practice or whatever it is. They can really help you out. Social capital is decreasing for Americans over time. Why? Because people are not staying so close to each other anymore. People are moving away. They take jobs in different parts of the country. Families kind of get uh, spread out and they go where the opportunities are, where the job is or where they can afford to live. And sometimes that means that families get separated over vast distances. And therefore, they can't really help each other as much as they could if they were near each other. In that case, you have to rely more on your neighbor and strangers and things like that. And you may not want to rely so much on those people. The ideal situation, of course, is that you have family members, people who are close to you, who live nearby, or maybe friends, then you can get a lot of social capital. But if they're far away, there's really not much they can do for you. Except maybe talk to you and make you feel better. They can't really help you out with anything physical. Now they can still maybe wire, wire you some money or deposit some money in your account, but it's easier to get things from relationships that uh, relationships of, of, of those people that are nearby. Are uh, the exchange of, uh, uh, are exchange relationships different in Western and non-Western cultures? Is it, are, are the uh, exchange uh, relationships different, okay? So here's the thing, as compared to more traditional societies, relationships in Western cultures, you know, like the US, Canada, Europe, you know, Australia, basically the white Western world, right? Uh, their relationships are more freely chosen. You can be friends with whoever you want as long as they wanna be friends with you, right? But their friendships are also less permanent. People come and go, they move away. They go to this college or that college, they transfer, they move away, they go get a job here or there and people enter your life and they leave your life very easily. You can choose, you know, you can have different friends, you know, as long as they want to have you as a friend uh, very easily, you have a lot of freedom, but you also have the freedom to lose them very easily. They come and go, okay? And even romantic relationships are torn apart by just opportunities, by freedom, where people just moving away to a certain college or moving away to a certain job or whatever it is. And of course, the, uh, the uh, relationships are also more individualistic. You get to choose, right? Not your family, not uh, the, uh, uh, the government, that kind of stuff, right? And of course, in non-Western cultures, you know, like more like uh, the, the cultures that are more traditional, more uh, collectivist, 
okay, where they're more group oriented, more family oriented, like, you know, uh, in uh, let's say the Latin American countries, uh, Africa, you know, uh, Middle Eastern countries, China, basically the rest of the world, the, the, the non-white world, okay? They're more collectivist. Their relationships are not so freely chosen. Sometimes their parents just don't allow just certain friendships or for you to associate with certain people, okay? Um, there was something sad recently that was in the news. There was this man in India who beheaded his own daughter. She, he cut off her head because she was seeing someone that he didn't want her to see. That's in India. Now that's an extreme, okay? You shouldn't do that. And the man did turn himself into police. But what I'm saying is some of these other cultures, they're a lot more strict. They don't want you to be with certain people and they don't allow certain people to be your friends and you're out of luck, okay? And some of them will just downright kick you out of the family or even kill you if you disobey or you still associate with those people. But that's an extreme, okay? Most countries are not that extreme, but let's just say that family has a lot of influence. Even among Latino cultures, they don't want you hanging around with certain people or wanting to, or they don't want you to have boyfriends or girlfriends you know, with certain people or marry certain people. They can have a lot of influence, make your life difficult, not accept it, okay? So not as freely chosen. And in some cases, extreme where you don't get to choose at all. In some places, your friends are chosen for you your marriage partner, all you know, those people in your life are chosen for you. You have no choice in it. That's the more extreme form. The relationships are also more permanent. You don't have a choice and you also don't get to just pick up and leave. You're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to get divorced, get remarried. You're not allowed to leave the family. So that's permanent, okay? And more collectivist, right? It's more about the group, the family, the society, not about you. It's about the group. There's also, um, uh, some of these differences that we see uh, are also related to like mobility. In some places, mobility is just harder than other places. Here in the US, you know, we're a richer country. Uh, most of us can afford cars. Uh, we can afford to fly. So we can go wherever we want, you know, and travel and just separate ourselves across vast distances. In other places, well, often they're not rich enough to, uh, for everyone to be able to afford a car, let alone fly right? Um, and therefore, they can't travel very far. So they tend, to, they tend to stick more to one area. And that means that their friends, the people who they married, tend to be in that area. This also has to do with differences in proximity to kin. So they, those people in more collective society, non-Western cultures, they'll live more close to their own families. And they don't really spread themselves out too much, like here in the US. Differences of individualism versus collectivism. I talked about it already. Individual freedoms, responsibilities, is it, is it the family, the group opinion that matters, or is it your individual opinion? Here in the US, you have the right, right, as long as you're an adult, to go where you wanna go, right? You, you can associate with whoever you wanna associate as long as they wanna associate with you, and you have those freedoms, right? It's different. Now, I know some of you, uh, maybe your parents are restricting you and they don't want you to associate with certain people, um, but if you're a grown up, you can say, screw you. You can't stop me, right? Uh, we have every right in this country to do what we want and to be with who we want, right? Uh, as long as we're not harming other people. And those are our rights. Um, but of course, when we're children, our parents can control us a bit more. But I'm assuming here that you're an adult, okay? Modern urban dwellers, yeah, they move away from close relatives. Here in the US, right, people move away. They travel, they take trains, they take, they get on a car, they fly away and you lose people. People come and go from your, your life. And that's what happens. My family used to live, and me and my extended family, we used to live just mostly in Southern California. And as the time has gone by and we have become more uh, Americanized, so to speak, more a part of this Western culture, more individualistic, the family has been moving apart spreading out all over the country. Now I have family in, in Vegas. I have family in Pennsylvania, uh, in, in, in Florida. We used to be all together. Now we're all over the place. And that's what, that's what happens as people become more individualistic and become more part of this Western culture. That's what you do. It's individualism. You go where you want to go. You go where the opportunities are and you leave people behind. Uh, that's it, you guys. That's where I'll stop.